Okay, I think we can start and then people can um, still join us. Um, a warm welcome to everyone. My name is Patricia Rink. I'm one of the research group leaders at Keta Hamburger Colleague Center for Global Cooperation Research here in Duisburg. And I would like to welcome you all to our Keta Hamburger lecture on misogyny and masculinity using gender to understand extremism. We are very grateful that our two guests, our speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Pearson, and our discussant, Dr. Alexandra Dier, accepted our invitation. And we are very happy that you've all joined our webinar. So why have we chosen this gloomy topic for our Keta Hamburger lecture? This is not necessarily one of our absolute core topics at the center, but at the center, we're interested in the role um, different worldviews play for global cooperation. We're interested in issues of legitimacy, contestation, basically in conflicts over conceptions of world order. And what we're witnessing currently is that the, the current world order is contested to say the least. There's a global backlash against gender equality, against um, the rights of women and queer people, also against the United Nations Women, Peace and Security agenda. This backlash against gender equality and liberalism is pushed by a diverse range of actors, among them authoritarian states, right-wing populists and religious groups, such as the Vatican, who have declared a war on so-called gender ideology, also very prominently by Vladimir Putin more recently. Um, Anti-feminist and misogynist rhetoric seems to be a unifying element that links um, these otherwise very different groups, as I said, from right-wing um, extremists, um, religious extremists, other autocrats, um, but also incels who, who want to punish women for potentially rejecting them. So anti-feminism seems to be an element that we find around the globe among uh, different groups that might otherwise not have too many similarities, and they seem to use it in their um, resistance to and uh, rejection of the liberal world order. At the same time, there are, of course, um, also women who join extremist groups who are apparently not deterred by the misogynist discourse, but might find it and um, the particular ideas of femininity and masculinity these groups would present attractive. So this is an intriguing and very important topic. It's obviously huge and can be discussed from many different angles. And we're looking forward to getting into discussions on it at the center. So we are very happy that um, Elizabeth agreed to be our speaker tonight. Dr. Elizabeth Pearson is a lecturer in criminology with the Conflict, Violence and Terrorism Research Center at Royal Holloway. Her research interests lie at the interface of gender extremism and counter extremism. She has a PhD from King's College London, in which she focused on masculinities in Islamist and radical right movements in the UK that we'll hear about today. Um, last year, she published a book um, co-authored with two colleagues on countering violent extremism, making gender matter, in which they focused on gender dynamics of extremism in five countries, namely Canada, France, the Netherlands, UK and Germany. Um, she has also done research on online extremism on Twitter and has worked at other um, extremist groups. And um, before joining academia, Elizabeth worked as a radio journalist um, with the BBC. And I think um, the comparative perspective from which she um, can speak is, is great and extremely helpful. And today she'll introduce us to her ethnographic research on far right and Islamist actors in the UK and her study of transnational jihadist groups. And we'll hear more about how um, gender is, is crucial for understanding um, the behavior of, and ideologies of these groups, their similarities, but also differences between them. So thank you very much for joining us today. We are also very glad that Alexandra could join us tonight. Dr. Alexandra Dier is Regional Advisor for Women, Peace and Security um, with UN Women, currently at the Regional Office for the Arab States. Um, prior to joining UN Women, she was a counterterrorism and gender expert at the UN Security Council Counterterrorism Executive Directorate, seat head. Um, she has worked for the UN in areas of conflict prevention and mediation, uh, peacekeeping and counterterrorism. She also served in UN field missions in Afghanistan and Burundi. Um, and she has a PhD uh, from the University in Oxford and uh, worked in several research institutes and think tanks before joining the UN. So she can, can comment on the lecture from a practitioner's point of view and share her practical experiences in the field of counterterrorism and gender with us, which I think is um, extremely valuable. So we're very much looking forward to your lecture, Liz, and your comments, Alexandra. Um, and just briefly, let me say a few words on how we will proceed. We will first hear Elizabeth's um, lecture of about 40 minutes, 
Um, then um, Alexandra will have time for her comments for about 10 minutes, and then we'll open up for Q&A. So um, you should see this Q&A function, um, and please send us your questions there. We will collect them and read them to the panelists. So thank you very much. And Liz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a, a, a very a kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen and if there are any issues with seeing it, then um, please do shout. How is that looking? Thumbs up. Good. Okay, that's good to see. Um, so thank you very much for um, inviting me to um, give this 47th Cater Hamburger lecture on misogyny and masculinity and using gender to understand extremism. And, you know, I was um, excited that you were having this um, venture, as you say, you don't normally look at gender and ex extremism, but this is kind of what I do in my research. Um, you mentioned in your introduction that I've looked, you know, through ethnic, semi-ethnographic work at um, activism in the far right and also in jihadist groups in the UK. And I've also kind of been interested in what's happening more globally in terms of jihadist groups, particularly, because as you mentioned in the introduction, um, it's important to kind of see the connections and what is going on on a kind of um, broader level. So, ah, oh, let me just see if I can move using this. So um, I'm going to talk in today's lecture around 30 to sort of 40 minutes about this idea of misogynistic terrorism and you know how we think about misogyny and its relationship to terrorism and extremism. And then I'm going to um, think a bit about masculinities and how we kind of frame and understand what's happening at the moment and where those connections lie and what kind of factors we can look at to try and understand what's happening. And finally, I'm going to kind of talk about the gendered approaches that I've used and what they have kind of, um, how they've changed my understanding, I guess, of what's happening in terms of gender and masculinities on the ground. Because the work that I've done has, well, I think the more interesting work for me has been the work where I have been talking to people who are involved in these groups. What do they get out of it? You know, where is it taking them? Um, why did they get involved? And I should mention that obviously we're talking about extremism, we're talking about, um, in some cases, terrorist actors, not just extremists, using violence to harm people. And so I have included images, mainly images in this um, lecture presentation, but also some text. And I'm talking about groups that, you know, seek to do harm to people. So there's hateful images, hateful narratives. And just please be aware of that, you know, if, um, if you're here and not expecting to hear anything <laughs> slightly disturbing, because these are disturbing groups doing disturbing things. So why are we thinking about misogyny? You know, we weren't always talking about misogyny and terrorism or extremism. And it's been a sort of more recent, you know, in my field, I work in academia, but as part of security studies, terrorism studies, international relations, you know, we've kind of, those of us working on gender have kind of battled a bit, I suppose. Um, many women before me for a long time to get gender taken seriously. But the events of the last sort of 10 years in terms of thinking about extreme and terrorist groups have essentially and transnationally um, put gender on the map, made gender headlines and basically made governments and policymakers aware that they can't afford not to think about gender or at the very least the treatment of women and what um, extreme and terrorist groups are doing to women. Um, I've got an image here of um, a terrorist group leader, someone from Boko Haram. You'll probably remember the abduction in 2014 of 276 young women, some escaped immediately. Um, many are still, we don't know what's happened to, you know, around sort of 30 remaining young women. Um, but this was an image that, you know, was shown around the world. It made very clear what uh, Nigerian colleagues had been sort of saying for a while. Um, that Boko Haram was using gender-based violence, so violence that, that was meted out on the basis of, you know, the sex you were or Boko Haram perceived you to be, and that this had resulted in this case in the abduction of all these young women. They were targeted specifically because they were choosing to go to a secondary school in northeast Nigeria, um, and this was part of a pattern. It was just the biggest example of, of that pattern. It's a terrorist group, not extremist. And you know, this lecture is about extremism, which is 
often understood as being more about what people think than about necessarily people committing violence. But the two things are kind of pretty much understood as linked through this idea of a journey of radicalization into extremism and then on to violence and perhaps sort of terrorist organizations. So this was impossible to ignore. And it was one of the moments at which, you know, the gender based violence of jihadist groups was made um, utterly clear and, and obvious. These girls were going to be sold at the slave market, according to the group's leader, Abu Bakr Shakao, and um, a, a promise he kind of did make good on, where they were subject to, to rape, to forced marriage, and then into various forms of forced violence. Islamic State, another jihadist group that had been uh, causing problems for Western governments by calling for Western foreign fighters to travel, both men and women. Here an image of fighters with a Yazidi woman. Once again, not just the genocide committed against the Yazidi people that was part of, you know, only one of the atrocities that was drawn to the attention of the international public through what Islamic State was doing, but the treatment specifically of Yazidi women. Yazidi women who were, again, um, in, enslaved in the terminology of Islamic State, abducted, taken, forced into marriages, raped, humiliated, tortured, and we're only now beginning to see um, some of the um, perpetrators of these forms of violence you know, brought to justice. And what these two incidents made very clear was that gender-based violence and specifically violence against women, um, the results of particular beliefs about women was absolutely entrenched into the activities of these groups, their functioning, their governance, um, and uh, indeed in the case of Islamic State, their motivation to foreign fighters to actually join. We were seeing incidences of collective violence against collective groups of women absolutely institutionalized, copied, lauded, applauded, and um, put on videos in order to kind of publicize these, um, these events. At the same time, um, we we're seeing violence that absolutely was all about misogyny. Jihadist groups have as an aim, obviously, a, a caliphate, an Islamic state, but in more recent years, we've seen the emergence from online groups of men riling each other up um, and discussing the ways in which they are, they are not respected in society, they can't get um, sexual partners, they um, absolutely kind of motivated and mobilized by a core hatred of particular women. And this has exploded into acts of in involuntary celibate so-called violence. This is, um, this is a news report from the United Kingdom from last year. And um, if this didn't kind of make clear that misogyny, the hatred of women was at the center of terrorist groups, um, then for feminist writers and people like myself who work in terrorism studies, you know, there could be no more obvious example of this. But we've seen also in, in extremist groups, you know, misogyny embedded into narratives, into ideology. You know, this image is from Australia and from the United Kingdom of anti-Islam demonstrators. Um, they are normally peaceful, organized protests, but at their heart, although they have a narrative of the protection of women, in this case from uh, Muslim men, as their kind of um, placards say here, this is about the inclusion of certain women and the exclusion of other women. Um, there is a um, pushback against the visible presence of Muslim women and the perceived changes, as they sort of stated, that that brings to society. And this is, again, about narratives of the control of women's bodies, women's appearances, and um, another way in which misogyny has been evident in um, movements that are transnational in their flavour. And so we've had kind of misogyny forced onto the agenda transnationally in both extreme and terrorist groups and a push to make misogyny um, specifically a kind of focus of attention for people seeking to understand you know, what is going on here. Um, misogynistic terrorism is a term that Karen Gentry, who's written about um, terrorism and gender for some years, used in relation to um, the incel group, 
and she argues in, in this article, you know, misogyny has been entirely missing in the field. It's not taken seriously. Misogynist violence is not understood as political. It's always personalized. And importantly, she says, you know, the field itself is institutionally misogynist and it's extremely difficult for institutions that are themselves a product of patriarchy, um, institutionalized negative gender norms to recognize misogyny and the damage it does when it's in front of them, when they are themselves embedded in those kinds of institutions. It doesn't take violence against women seriously and this is clearly not just a problem of the field of terrorism studies. And then I also reference um, a book that's written by a UK journalist. This um, book by uh, Joan Smith is really just about, you know, the ways in which um, terrorism begins with domestic violence. It's about misogynist attitudes and um, essentially there are linkages between terrorism as a crime. It's not an exceptional form of crime. It's just a crime and, um, and with misogyny and with abuse of women. And the definition, which I haven't given so far, of, uh, of misogyny in, in Karen Gentry's article, um, she uses a definition um, from someone called Kate Mann and basically talks about misogyny being like it's a, it's a mechanism. It's not necessarily about the hatred of women. It's about um, putting sexism into practice through particular sort of um, behaviours, the policing of women, their clothing, their bodies, their behaviour. Um, in ways that will uphold patriarchal systems and, you know, strata of men's power, forcing some women to conform and forcing some women to conform in other ways. So it's about dividing women between the sort of good women and the bad women and making sure that those infractions are punished. And, you know, as you also alluded to in the introduction, some of this policing of women, I've seen this, you know, online and online studies happens by other women. It's not just men, but men and women that are able to kind of enforce um, misogyny. Now, I have to say that I haven't myself kind of really um, talked a great deal about misogyny. I haven't used it as a framework in the work that I've done. And there is a kind, there is a reason for that. I've used gender as a kind of, as a framework, as a way of understanding extremism uh, and terrorism. And here, you know, um, I, I'm sure I, everyone knows what I mean when I'm talking about gender, but we're talking about, you know, um, socially constituted behavioral expectations. So what people think and understand about the rules governing, you know, who we perceive to be and who, who is particular um, sexism, gendered identities and, I've been thinking also a lot about masculinities and partly I must confess that that sort of how I got into using and thinking about masculinities was because I simply I couldn't really access women when I was out in the field kind of trying to talk to activists the women wouldn't talk to me it was just the, it was just the men that would speak to me so I had to you know read the, the literature on masculinities because otherwise I you know I had no way of understanding what I was kind of being confronted with in the field. But what we're talking about, you know, in Connell's kind of definition, which is um, from her website, is that, you know, we're talking about um, gendered relations. And so when you look at gender relations, when you look at positions in a gender order, in a hierarchy, um, when you think about status and you think about power and you're looking about at what people are doing, um, how they're sort of performing, what they understand as, as gender, in order to gain power, because often extremist and terrorist groups are all about power, the exercising of power, and the, um, then you see misogyny, it becomes apparent, but it becomes apparent not just um, as in men's objectification and victimization of women, but of the ways in which men and women together produce these hierarchies and enable certain forms of misogyny. So um, I suppose for me and the way that I think about gender, Misogyny is apparent by using a gendered approach, but just kind of saying that terrorism is misogynist is not the whole story, because misogyny is one part of how gender relations function in, in these groups that I've, um, you know, been looking at. And when we're thinking about masculinities, we're also sort of thinking about uh, hegemonic masculinity, which is a term that Connell uses, it's kind of the, the most high status masculinity. And um, also two other forms of masculinity that Connell uses, which are important in thinking about terrorism and extremism, are subordinate masculinities and marginalized masculinities. And what becomes clear is that we're not just kind of thinking and talking about gender, we're thinking about power and how gender constructs identities that are also race 
past and um, faith comes into so there's various different identities so it enables us to think in a more dynamic way about the relations between men and women and how you know when misogyny is is present and interwoven into the ideologies of groups how how that is enabled and how that happens and really you know in all the research that i've done and i think the examples of misogynist practice um demonstrates that you know the gendered practices gendered ideology gender differentiation between men's roles women's roles um, how men and women are understood in ideologies cultural practices and um, of men and women are really a kind of fundamental backbone um, enabling everything that extreme groups in this contemporary space do everything that they think and and how they are organized um, so gender is extremely important. It's um, gendered ideology legitimizes particular behaviors, including who can perform violence and, you know, what, what types of violence are acceptable. So with Islamic State, we know that, you know, mostly it was men that were understood to be fighters. Women were understood to have very domestic roles. But we also saw women's violence, for, in, for instance, in uh, the domestic space against Yazidi slaves. It's still violence. It's just not violence on a battlefield. So through these sort of gender binaries, these distinctions, firm distinctions between the ways in which men and women are understood, groups are able to organize themselves. But, you know, I would talk about this sort of towards the end of the lecture. You know, what I found when I was talking to activists was that you know, the, the practice and the theory are two quite different things. And uh, these binaries became quite muddled in practice and what people thought and what they said and what they liked to think were often, you know, quite, quite different things. One other thing, again, which, you know, you alluded to um, at the start of this lecture is that we're not just talking about, you know, violence against women. This is um, violence which is organized, not just according to sex, but also according to sexuality. And it's incredibly important when you look at the kinds of activities. And, and this is sometimes occluded by kind of conversations that are just about sort of focusing on the abuse of, of women's rights. When you take a gendered approach and you think about masculinities, you're thinking about men not simply as perpetrators and women as victims, which is a narrative which you know, gender scholars have been trying to push away from um, for some years, not because women aren't victims and not because men aren't perpetrators. Men, men do make up the majority of perpetrators in these groups, but because that's not the whole story. And when you take a sort of gendered approach and look at the gendered relations, and you don't have to do that, you know, they were these groups are putting this front and center. You see the ways in which men are being victimized. You know, there's um, an image from a newspaper article. Um, this is a sort of far right um, attack, a plan to attack a gay pride, uh, uh, an attack on a gay pride event. On the other um, top corner, you see um, a slightly um, hazy image of Boko Haram executing men. They had a very gender differentiated approach to violence where women would be abducted, uh, raped. Um, men are much more likely to be killed by Boko Haram fighters, particularly if they refuse to, um, to go with them and to join the group and fight. And the last image is from an Islamic State propaganda video showing the execution of a gay man, which um, they uh, were pushing people off buildings. So this, so misogyny is not the whole story It's part of a story about the way in which gender works functions what it enables what kind of violence it incorporates and even looking at the you know so-called manifesto of the buffalo shooter you know he actually talks about um uh, admitting gay people into his sort of white supremacist fold as, as long as they're white supremacists but what was a step too far for him is, is trans um, ideology so this isn't a story about men and women um, it's a story about gender identities it's a story about sex and sexuality and that's kind of a bit absent when we're kind of thinking just about misogyny and not about gender-based violence not that misogyny doesn't matter it's absolutely important in in this and definitely important to recognize so one of the, you know, so how, how does this really help us, I guess, you know, thinking about masculinities, um, because the danger is, and I think we've seen this a bit, is that we have this kind of conversation around um, 
the wrong masculinities. Well, it's a problem of the wrong masculinities. It's a problem of the wrong men doing the wrong things. And if only we could make all the men healthy and, and good, then we wouldn't have these issues. And we've seen kind of a couple of dominant discourses here, which kind of tend to um, homogenize the issue and create this kind of monolithic problem of toxic men and toxic masculinity. And we've had quite a lot of discussion, particularly in policy circles, you know, in the UK over the last few years about a crisis of masculinity, you know, what, what's happening to men at the moment. And again, this ties into what you were saying in the introduction about have we got this crisis of masculinity? Is, is the problem that globally men can't cope with globalization? It's something that you know masculinity scholars have written about. Um, what? Why do they need to push back against that? Because we do see a pushback against feminism um, in the narratives of some far right groups, not all, and in jihadist groups. And and there are not the only two ideologies, of course, that can produce extremism. And an example of you know, this is just one newspaper example. Um, but, you know, the problem with thinking about toxic masculinity as a global killer um, is that, you know, this becomes a kind of explanatory factor without really kind of understanding what, what, what is really going on here. Um, because saying they're almost always men doesn't really help us in, in any way, shape or form in kind of preventing or, or understanding this violence. Toxic masculinity, you know, to give it a sort of definition, is um, as a definition by Coopers, which I've used, um, and he defines it as the constellation of socially regressive male traits that serve to foster domination, the devaluation of women, homophobia, and wanton violence. So we've got homophobia here as well as misogyny, and but it's about you know socially regressive male traits. So what that is, you know, he talks a bit more about. But, you know, we've always um, we've always had gender in thinking about extremism, you know, even if it hasn't been explicitly there. Um, and that's one of the kind of dangers of this narrative, because, you know, even without thinking about gender, the things that governments do in order to counter terrorism and extremism are gendered. So if you think about, you know, how um, post 9-11 governments sought to kind of stop radicalization, there was a focus on particular men. And there's been lots written about this by Muslim scholars about the ways in which Muslim men were securitized, understood as risky, dangerous, subject to change and transformation. And we have this kind of, again, idea that it's those subordinate, dangerous, uneducated, angry, stupid, racist, um, vulnerable, gullible men that are the problem. Um, and of course, again, you can't escape from race, from class in, in these um, discussions. So it becomes, again, you know, it's which, which men are the, are the problem and how do we stop them being the problem? And conversely, when you've got particular men as the problem, then, you know, you fall back into this kind of, you know, we have to protect, we have to protect everyone from these men, but we have to protect women. You know, we saw post 9-11, the idea of protecting Muslim women from, you know, Muslim men. And then this idea that, you know, if misogyny is a problem, then maybe gender equality will be one of the solutions, you know, and we can empower women and this will make everything better, which, you know, is not necessarily straightforwardly understood as positive by the people that, you know, you're taking this to and um, has echoes of neocolonialism in, in some contexts. And, you know, where, how and who is delivering this message depends on how it plays. And in fact, it can backfire because gender equality can be one of the things that extreme groups are pushing back against. So I don't, you know, I, I use masculinities, but I'm using this as an example to say, well, you know, we've got a problem when we think that there is a particular kind of masculinity that is the one that we need to avoid and the one that we need to focus on if we're going to stop mass murder, gang members and extremists. And I, um, I think that, you, you know, this idea of um, masculinity, so this is a cartoon from one, uh, one of Michael Kimmel's um, pieces. And, you know, he, he's talked for a long time about uh, masculinities and essentially, you know, he, he is interested in kind of moving away from these monolithic narratives that pathologize, you know, particular men, um, often, you know, marginalized men. And, you know, he's interested in thinking about structural issues. He's interested in thinking about, you know, what is going on in the lives of, um, of the men that are in these groups. You know, he, one of a number of scholars doing that. And in this kind of um, 
in this cartoon, a kind of Nazi cartoon shows this idea of, you know, this emasculated liberal, you know, wearing a jacket with a sort of lampshade, kicking over a chair in frustration with his booklet. And the way that he can, you know, become a, a real man with a, a, a real body and stop being pushed around in the world is to, um, is to become this kind of, you know, swastika tattooed um, real man. And this is the kind, you know, this is the kind of toxic masculinity, I suppose. This is what toxic masculinity means. It's about these kind of um, just transformation into this kind of um, super Superman figure who isn't going to be kicked around anymore. Um, and this is a pushback, a protest uh, against emasculation. And we have seen, you know, in the narratives of Islamic State talking about the emasculation of men in the West, um, the end of real men, the end of real uh, roles, going against nature, going against God. We have seen these arguments in jihadist and in far right groups. And the group is a kind of resource in order to push back against emasculation. And it's a form of, of protest. It's a way of kind of um, getting status. And it's to do with men's bodies. It's to do with their physicality. We've also seen the idea kind of um, of hypermasculinity. Again, it's kind of another sort of explanatory um, kind of um, way of thinking about what's happening in extreme groups and you know not without reason because this is the kind of propaganda that islamic state is putting out um they had numerous kind of um numerous uh, memes and images talking about what real men would do uh, real men go and fight jihad real men fight back real men are the protectors and maintainers of women they don't use the real the real word here but you know it's in other propaganda and you've got the image of the warrior but you've also got the image of the protector and again this is these go hand in hand the warrior protector is in relation to women and children it's not distinct from it's not just a man on his own it's about his relationship with particular women and we've seen that again in sort of almost, you know, the mirror image in our neo-Nazi and Nazi um, propaganda. The idea that the man is the breadwinner, they have an association with the land, they look after the land, they protect the land for the woman and child. And you have the 14 words here, um, which is a kind of Nazi, neo-Nazi creed. So there are things in common, and there are reasons why this idea of toxic masculinity and hypermasculinity have kind of become quite prevalent in accounts of, you know, the way in which masculinity plays, you know, plays into um, the formation of extreme actors. Uh, and um, so there's, there's truth there, but it's not a kind of, you know, it's very, it's very broad brush, and it's kind of quite monolithic. And it also suggests that, you know, extremism, these toxic people, there's something separate, there's something different. And in the research that I've done, you know, what I've found is that, you know, firstly, although I have seen these kinds of masculinity, I've also seen diverse expressions of masculinities, which I'm going to spend the last sort of 10 minutes of the talk, you know, talking about. And that these masculinities were not distinct, you know, they were completely congruent with the kinds of rhetoric that we see in wider society that other, because these people had identities that were not just their extreme identity, their identity within their wider community from which they have also emerged. And they also, um, in terms of their actions and their beliefs, there was a great deal of continuity between, you know, the things that they were doing before they ever entered the group. So not everything that I saw was about toxic masculinity or about fighting and about being this sort of uh, hyper masculine warrior and as as you noted at the start you know women's participation is also incredibly important you know where is the space for that when we're kind of thinking about the masculinity of these groups in these kinds of ways so I just want to kind of spend the last 10 minutes really kind of talking a bit about what I found in the field research that I was doing. So the field research I did was with extremists, although some people did get convicted of terrorist offences um, while I was doing the research, um, a couple of them. And um, I was doing this research in the UK between 2016, the field research in 2018. And um, I was talking to people that are involved in uh, counter Islam, radical right, far right, it's an umbrella term, but some people would use it for the kinds of people that I was talking to. 
Um, and I was also talking to Islamist um, actors. And so I was going to demonstrations and, and I was, this is not my photograph, but I was kind of talking to people that would, you know, turn up looking like this, I suppose. <laughs> um, and it became sort of quite normal, actually, I suppose, I suppose, going to demonstrations and talking to people. Whereas prior to the research, I would have, you know, I wouldn't, I would have balked at, I guess, talking to people. So some of what I found, you know, is kind of consistent with this idea that of what, you know, Kimmel shows in that uh, Nazi cartoon that, you, you know, we've got men who felt that they were being walked over and, you know, um, wanted to find a way of um, countering that emasculation, which sounds very basic, but these were the stories that people were saying. But this is before this guy, Darren, came into the group. He's living in an area which he kind of perceives as being quite threatening, where in which he can be a target, you know, not, not a target of Muslims, but a, a target of his own community. And he cultivates a physicality that shows and demonstrates his capacity for violence. That's incredibly important. And through doing that, he actually becomes somebody who he says his reputation spreads, it keeps you out of trouble for life. You know, it actually had not kept him out of trouble for life at all. He was in trouble all of his life, um, but different kind of trouble, a trouble that he felt he was in control of and that he enjoyed. So violence that um, against Muslims, violence against Muslims that, you know, he, he basically enjoyed and felt that he was in control of. But there was this familiar story of um, using, um, a, a developing a kind of physicality which projected the capacity for violence that then was continued into this um, radical milieu in which, you know, he, it becomes part of an extremist group. But these extreme kind of masculinities were kind of, they were quite complicated and they were being kind of created in this kind of crucible where people were being confronted with their race, their sex, their identity and their space. And this was kind of um, leading them into, you know, these moments where they considered all of those things and they made a choice. So, so I'm asking people, tell me like, you know, what got you into a group? And they will tell me a moment when this was, you know, they, they decide they made a choice. And this was a moment for a guy we're called Dan. He was, um, he had actually been in the army and he had been in Iraq, he told me. And this was the moment that he, he decided he had to join um, a, a radical right anti-Islam group. And it's a moment in which he is kind of policing his neighborhood. He's trying to stop a crime happening that he perceives to be by Muslims. He is confronted with his whiteness, but it's not a privilege. It's not a good thing in this context. It's used as an insult against him. And um, he's also being attacked. And at the same time that his whiteness is not a privilege to him, which is what he expects. And it, they're also confronting him with ownership of his town. So he is, you know, he's only lived in his town and been with the army. And this kind of confrontation regarding his town, because place was extremely important to those radical right participants. And a, a lot of what they were doing was about claiming spaces in gendered terms, marching into towns where there had been arrests to do with um, grooming gangs who had Muslim names and had an immigrant heritage, marching through those streets, shouting, you know, whose streets, our streets. So it's about ownership. It's about, you know, race, sex, gender, masculinity, and ownership of the space. So this was a really key moment for him. But in this moment also, you know, there's a lot of continuity. So for Dan, I guess, like, he kind of felt his values had never changed from being in the army. They'd been the same. But in the army, he was kind of praised, um, not valorized, but, you know, people thought that was a good thing. That he was in the army. And now he had the same values, but he was doing this policing in his local space. This was a bad thing now, and he couldn't really understand what had happened, you know, um, because there hadn't been a, a vast radical transformation here for him. He was doing the same stuff with the same values. And also these values were shared by, you know, the communities around him. So this wasn't really, a, this wasn't really about, um, this wasn't, about something that was very different or necessarily 
in, entirely um, toxic. There was a lot of here that was sort of very shared with the rest of um, society. And what I saw kind of, you know, when I was talking to people um, you know, generally was that there was, you know, there were lots of different things going on in terms of, you know, masculinities and gendered performances within these groups. The way that gender was evident in the activism um, that I saw, you know, really differed between different forms of protest. So um, in, I've got three images here. One is of, um, the top one is a, a, um, a woman called Anne-Marie Waters. She does stand for election. She never gets elected in local elections. She stands on an anti-Islam platform, essentially for a group called For Britain, but um, she used to be a Labour activist. She's a gay woman, she's actually Irish. Um, she does not call herself a feminist and she gets quite a lot of abuse from other sort of people in the far right, men in the far right. Her demonstrations, you know, kind of built on a kind of culture of feminist demonstration actually, involve always a lot of women actors. Uh, she rejects the term feminism. She campaigns on a kind of gay rights um, uh, agenda because she believes that Islam doesn't you know, doesn't respect gay rights or, or women's rights. Um, and then you've got beneath that uh, Britain First, which is um, a quite sort of outwardly racist organization. Again, it takes part in uh, democratic elections. It was at that time, uh, the leader was a woman in the purple, deputy leader, Jada Franson, was um, a very different kind of cultural um, vibe. This was uh, very militaristic, a lot of, uh, um, military kind of symbolism, um, bands playing, they had, they had sort of paramilitary outfits for their security, Britain first security guys. They described themselves as in battalions. Um, they would do these uh, mosque invasions where they would go into mosques. So a completely different kind of language jargon and way of you know, presenting oneself at these demonstrations than what Anne-Marie Waters is doing, although there's some overlap between what they believe. And then on the other side is this um, Democratic Football Lads Alliance, which was active, again, on a counter-Islam platform, using a lot of the kind of symbolism and culture of um, football. Um, and so, and very similar in terms of the, the day out, you know, you get on a bus, you go drinking at the pub before you go on the demo, you've got your football gear on, you've got your football um, badges. So this is like, you know, and there's nothing unique about the kind of cultural practices and the, mas the masculinities or femininities that are on display here. They're entirely borrowing, borrowing from a pre-existing set of, you know, cultural um, symbols and, and indeed practices. And, um, you know, for many of them, they're actually doing the same thing that they've just been doing the whole time in, in their own lives. So there was a lot of diversity here. And in fact, that, di that diversity was, was one of the reasons it you know, enabled people to make a decision about which group they were going to join. And it caused frag fragmentation and arguments between the groups around you know, the things that they were doing and where their priorities lay. So what you've got is kind of you know, continuities, but also differentiation. They're using gender equality arguments. Anne Marie Waters uses gender equality. Oh, they all use gender equality arguments, gay rights arguments. Now, these are not neo Nazi groups. There are other groups with different ideologies on the far right that would not support gay rights arguments or indeed gender equality arguments. But they're using these arguments um, and they are you know, presenting them in different ways with different subcultures. And you know, this enables the men on these demonstrations to kind of display particular emotions, not just aggression, other emotions as well. Um, and you know, there was a lot of different things going on here. This wasn't just about one kind of idea of what masculinity is. Now I'm gonna, um, I haven't got as much to say about the Islamists, but um, the point that I want to make here is that, you know, I didn't speak to as many different actors. I was mainly just talking to um, Anjem Chowdhury, who's the leader of a band group called al Mahajirun. He went to jail actually when um, during the research and I went to his trial and I met some of his um, supporters. And then I spoke to some of them about, you know, what they, what they, um, what their activism involved, what they got out of it. Um, so there's more, there's more uniformity because I was only talking to like one set of Islamists, if you like. But even here, in terms of um, the masculinities that were present, you know, we've got some overlap. We've got again this idea of you know holding your own in a fight, um, 
this kind of sense of having to um, project a particular kind of physicality. You know, these sometimes these um, actors were um, living in the same kinds of areas, you know, socioeconomically, not not sort of um, the, the richest areas, um, socioeconomic problems. Um, and this kind of sense of um, street masculinities was important. But again, it wasn't the kind of full story. But what I saw was that there'd been a lot of retention of a lot of the practices that had evolved in as they expressed it within a particular space um, and a, within a particular kind of um, milieu in which they were expected to have to hold their own in, in terms of violence. But there was a lot more than this going on. You know, when you talk to people about why they're involved in the groups, these Islamists reflected on their desires to, this is all Islamic State propaganda, some of which you've seen, you know, the desire to not just be, a, you know, a, a warrior for um, not Islamic State, but, you know, for, um, for Chowdhury's group, you know, they couldn't tell me that they supported Islamic State because it's illegal. But also, you know, their, their desire to become learned, to learn Arabic, to become scholars, um, and, you know, again, you know, to protect women, to protect. So this is why I couldn't access the women, in fact, because they wanted to protect those women and stop me from actually kind of, you know, meeting them and talking to them. So they would talk about, you know, what got them into, what got them into the group? Well, you know, they talked about their backgrounds, you know, they talked about fights, they talked about um, feeling ill at ease with, with the gender norms of society, but they also talked about poetry. They talked about, you um, crying, being utterly distressed by images from um, Iraq and Syria. So they were not they were not ashamed or afraid to admit to these kind of more these more vulnerable forms of masculinity, these more feminized um, expressions of masculinity, if you like. And finally, and I, I don't want to go too much over time. Um, so, you know, a, a problem get you know so I, I've, I've talked about really in in very briefly about some of the the differences, the nuances, the kinds of um, varieties of masculinities that are, if, you, if you're if you trying to kind of, you know, I'm looking at these transcripts, I'm trying to sort of think what's going on here? What am I seeing? You know, is it is it about, is it toxicity? Is it is it hyper-masculinity? What, you know, what can I see in language of people like Kim and Connell? And, and I saw a lot of things that I wasn't expecting to see. And, you know, I think the other thing that's really important to note is that, you know, if we're thinking and talking about misogyny and we're talking about, regressive male tra traits we have to think about the ways in which you know women engage in um propagating misogyny because we know that misogyny is a really widespread problem in society we know that you know if uh, being a woman online is extremely um difficult but you know this report from demos here you know shows that 50 percent they thought of tweets that were misogynistic were coming from women which you know many people struggle to understand they've always struggled to understand why would a woman join an extreme group that is a misogynist that doesn't protect women's rights well um plenty of women join jihadist groups plenty of women um join far-right groups and they have done for years as evidenced by women marching you know for the ku klux klan you've got people like lauren southern you know um an alt-right um, figurehead who, you know, also talked about the abuse that she got from some corners of the far right, you know, telling her that it wasn't her place to be in front of a camera. And she was angry about it. Um, uh, but, you know, as if she shouldn't have expected this. So women are participating and they are embracing what, you know, what is being classified as misogyny. Um, they are embracing gender binaries that, uh, you know, suggest and um, see women in domestic roles and they are um, vaunting those roles they do not think that um, motherhood is a um, is, is a role that shouldn't be sort of lauded and they are wholeheartedly recruiting and mobilizing around their uh, their ideas and the ideas that are coming from some of these you know misogynist um, extreme and terrorist groups they're not to, they're not put off by them that they're, they're completely consistent with how they understand um, um, the world to, to be in the problems that they perceive in, in, currently in, in society. But they, in the people that I spoke to, it, it this just wasn't, you know, it wasn't completely straightforward. You know, there are tensions. If you're going to be part of a group in which, you know, there's gender binary 
dictates that, you know, men and women have totally different roles. There's got to be some kind of um, pushback when you try and become integrated into that group. And, you know, this again, going back to Darren, who grew up, you know, he, um, he is he's talking about women in the English Defence League, um, anti-Islam group. And, you know, he he didn't take them seriously. He used abusive, misogynist language against those women as well. He says, I despise them. They're filth bags. He also despised Muslims, liberals, people like me who, you know, um, were Remainers and who wanted, you know, you know, who, who cried about Brexit, which I, you know, openly admitted to, which they thought was hilarious, you know. So this is, a, and this is, again, this is a kind of class, um, this word slappers, this is a kind of derogatory term that is used against, you know, um, it's a sexual term. Um, and it's often used against, you know, working class white women. And there is a lot of literature on, on this. But, you know, he's calling these women who are active in his group, who are trying to do the things the men were doing, you know, being promiscuous, sleeping with people. That's what the men were doing on some of these um, days out. You know, they're getting a lot of hate and not just I'm using him. But, you know, this was this was another reason why I couldn't talk to the women, because in the EDL, in the radical right, they didn't want to identify themselves as such. So I'm going to end, and um, I um, I just have some questions, really. You know, what I've wanted to do is kind of just show um, some of the complexities um, that emerge when you try and think of, you know, misogynistic terrorism or, you know, toxic masculinity, and really want to think, and, you know, hopefully Alexandra will have some, like, some more questions probably or some answers to this. You know, how does it help our understanding to d define these things as misogynistic? You know, how, how do we see this reflected in wider society? What are the costs for women of, you know, these cultures? Why do they still participate in these groups? And, you know, again, thinking about masculinities, how does it help? Because, you know, so far, and I could be wrong, I'm not sure how much positive impact any of this has, has actually had in terms of, you know, the, the policy and counter-terrorism or counter-violent extremism approaches, although it's all very interesting for people like me. So I'm going to stop there. And thank you very much for your patience and coming back after the um, interruption. Um, but I'm going to stop the share there. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Elizabeth, for this very vivid and engaging lecture and also for coming back after after we went on for a bit, I think um, you've given us a very differentiated picture of how broad the topic of gender and extremism is. And as you said, um, also about um, the varieties uh, in which um, this, this can manifest. And great that you've also posed some questions, which hopefully Alexandra will <laughs> now answer or maybe add to. So yes, please, Alexandra. Uh, thank you so much, um, and good evening, everyone. Um, it's a it's a real pleasure to to have the opportunity to to participate um, in this discussion. And um, Dr. Pearson's research on on issues of gender and and violent extremism um, always stands out to me as as particularly thoughtful and and nuanced. And this lecture was was another example of that. So so thank you so much, Liz, for for a really um, interesting and and enriching um, uh, presentation. Um, so then I, um, as agreed, will we'll provide a few reflections on these issues from, uh, from a policy uh, perspective, giving a little bit more of, of a practical angle to, to some of these questions. Um, and um, I, I do want to highlight that um, uh, certainly the, the research um, that Liz has done um, and that she just presented um, is very much, I mean, it's, it's important and it's part of, of a new and exciting and, and rapidly growing body of literature on issues around gender and terrorism and violent extremism. And I think, first of all, it's um, important to, know that, to note that it is a really positive development to see this research grow and engage with these issues from, um, uh, from a growing range of different perspectives and with increasing granularity. And uh, I really think that to do justice to these phenomena that we are looking at here, that, that sort of engaging with that level of complexity is, is really important. Um, but it also does pose a number of challenges from, from a policy perspective. Um, and I think um, it's, um, uh, yeah, it, it's fairly obvious to, uh, to say that um, policy has been lagging 
uh, in terms of uh, its ability to take some of those research findings into consideration and, and include that in, um, uh, in actual uh, practice. So um, what I thought I would do is just highlight maybe three or four key challenges uh, in doing that from, from, a, policy, from a policy perspective. Um, and so, first of all, what I would say is, um, and Liz alluded to this uh, as well, the, the progress in taking gender seriously, I think, is certainly there. Also, in the in the policy and practitioner community, there is and has been over the past uh, few years a growing recognition that gender matters in relation to uh, violent extremism, and more recently. Uh, increasingly also that a gender focus needs to consider also issues related to masculinity. But then beyond that basic recognition that, that these uh, issues matter, the question becomes more tricky in terms of how do they matter? What does that actually mean meaningfully to include gender perspectives um, in policymaking? Um, and what does it mean to make counterterrorism and, and countering violent extremism policies gender sensitive? Um, and I think that there has unfortunately been a sort of um, an expectation that, you know, that the gender is, is, it's like this single issue. There is a box that we can tick and then we've taken gender uh, into account. And the reality is, of course, much more complicated than, than that. It is a perspective that needs to be incorporated throughout the full cycle of um, analyzing, identifying the problem that we are dealing with, incorporating it into policy design, ensuring that it is thought about and, and included at all stages of implementation of these policies as well. And then that it needs to go beyond this initial simple understanding of gender as uh, being equal to the roles of women in, in violent extremism. Um, and so this newer focus, this um, newer focus on, on masculinities and the recognition that, well, maybe there is something here that, that needs to be taken into, into account as well, if we're going to address gender meaningfully also from a, from a policy perspective. Um, it then, well, if you look at uh, research such as the one we, we just heard about, there are so many dimensions to this. And so how do we actually, in practice, in policy, go beyond, um, as, as we just heard, just thinking about certain groups of so-called problematic men? How do we get to these like really important and complex issues that Liz talked about in terms of um, gender being so closely intertwined with the very basic structural power dynamics that we are seeing. Um, and especially if you then add to that the important issue uh, that the institutions themselves, the ins where counterterrorism policy is made and implemented, are of course themselves subject to the very same gender hierarchies and, and dynamics. These, these issues are embedded within these institutions as well. So how do we make them also step outside of those logics and actually how can we expect them to meaningfully start addressing um, these sort of more structural gender factors that are, uh, that are um, uh, systemic and 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 that uh, that are prevalent uh, across different uh, different types of, of violent extremist movements. So I think the point that I'm trying to to make really is that this um, it's a complex and, and and difficult issue from from a policy perspective to address in that more meaningful um, way, rather than just having this um, this more simple box ticking approach of like, well, we've included some some gender language and and now we we dealt with with gender. Um, then on um, the issue of, of misogyny, I think there were some really excellent questions there for, uh, for all of us to think about in terms of what misogyny actually means and uh, how it relates to the, uh, to the phenomena of, of terrorism and violent extremism. And I think one of the key questions here, again, if we, if we want to develop policies uh, to address this issue is, well, what is it exactly that we are trying to address here? Um, and what is the relationship between misogyny uh, 
and violent extremism? Is it, are we saying that misogyny is a causal driver of violent extremism, or is it an objective that these groups are trying to, to realize? Uh, or is it just a, a trait or a characteristic that just happens to be prevalent in, um, in most, if not, if not all of, of these groups? And of course, how we answer that, that question about that relationship has implications for uh, the types of specific policy recommendations that we would then want uh, to make. Um, and another important point on that, and, and this we, we heard about this as well, the kind of um, how do we then deal with the fact that well, misogyny is unfortunately a phenomenon that is extremely widespread throughout society. What does that then in relation to violent extremism uh, mean for our for our responses is the answer then that um, counter terrorism and countering violent extremism policy is really the appropriate policy tool or policy space to be addressing these issues of um, of misogyny or is it just a particular subset of of issues where misogyny will be present but um, only in a more stricter sense relating to issues of, of violent uh, extremism and, and sort of where do we where do we find that that sort of cutoff point or that threshold uh, could be one question to ask. On the other hand, how do we also um, incorporate an understanding of this continuum that is important, that, th that there is this spectrum of violence, there is a spectrum of misogynistic beliefs across society. Um, and so we don't want to neglect that either. So again, you see, there are very tricky questions that um, we have not conclusively answered in the research space, and we have not, certainly not answered in the, in the policy space. Um, and so then um, I wanted to maybe elaborate a little bit more on that, on what I've already sort of hinted at in terms of uh, to what extent are counterterrorism tools appropriate to be dealing with some of these phenomena? Um, and on that, I would want to emphasize, first of all, that when it comes to issues of, of violent misogyny and the increasing attention that it has been getting um, in, in um, popular newspaper coverage linked to some of these incel attacks that we've had in recent years, um, and, and so forth. I think there is a very fundamental problem there. If the attention is now being paid to this phenomenon, to the issue of misogyny, because it is being associated with the issue of violent extremism. So I think it's really important to be very clear that violence against women and violent manifestations of misogyny and misogyny itself are a problem in and of themselves and not just because of any potential link that they may or may not have to, to terrorism. Um, and secondly, I think then we need to also remind ourselves that counterterrorism tools are very powerful, very intrusive, um, often not subject to the kind of oversight mechanisms that exist in most other policy areas and that there is a real risk of, of doing harm. And so um, a counterterrorism response does privilege a, a securitized approach to certain issues. And so applying this to issues uh, such as violence against women and violent misogyny um, is something that we need to think about very carefully because we don't want to securitize the response to these phenomena. And we have seen in, in very concrete examples where, um, where these kinds of links were actually being made in, in practice um, that the repercussions were, were very serious and were not in line with the kind of survivor-centered approach that we want to be taking where the safety and, and protection of these women is actually our primary concern. So the specific example uh, uh, that I can give you are instances where we have seen that if um, police with law enforcement agencies were actually trying to uh, create these linkages and, and use um, prevalence of, of domestic violence and violence against women as a potential uh, factor, early warning sign or predictor of, of violent extremism, 
uh, many women were expressing um, concern uh, that they were being actually deterred from reporting instances of, of domestic violence. Because again, the threat, especially in, in certain communities that are already very much sort of subject to surveillance from, from law enforcement and, and under suspicion of, of uh, potentially being um, associated with, uh, with extremism, the risk of, of being given this terrorist label is, is seen as something extremely, extremely negative. And um, so even in some cases where um, a woman would, um, would want to address issues of domestic violence, she does not necessarily want to do that to have then also the terrorism label attached to her family and often by extension to her entire community. Um, and she might, in fact, be even facing repercussions from within the community itself uh, for that. So again, it just creates a deterrent rather than an encouragement, actually, for reporting um, of, um, of um, instances of, of violence against women. Another example that I think is, is useful to think about because it's, it, it's a very, um, um, very much a sort of a, a current concern um, that is violence in, uh, in the online space, um, where again, we have seen uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of misogynistic hate speech uh, um, against women online. Again, this is another reflection of this phenomenon, unfortunately being very widespread throughout society. And so again, the question emerges if we're, if we're coming with our, with our intrusive counterterrorism tools, I mean, we are potentially advocating for mass surveillance of a very wide range of individuals who have not necessarily committed uh, any violent acts or, or crimes, um, right? They, they might be engaging in, in other uh, problematic and objectionable behavior. But again, it's about what is the appropriate policy tool to deploy in such situations and in those contexts. And now think about the really staggering increase of online misogynistic abuse uh, and hate speech that we have seen in particular uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and, and since. And I mean, it's been, it's been documented, these rates are really, um, are really quite astonishing globally. Um, and you see that we are dealing with a mass phenomenon where again, the question, the question is, well, what are the most appropriate tools to be, to be addressing that? And I think it makes very clear that sort of approaching this problem purely from a, a counter-terrorism or counter, countering violent extremism perspective is actually an extremely limited way of, of looking at the problem that we are confronting. So um, I think that this then um, goes to um, sort of my final point, um, which is to say that these are issues that we certainly we want to be addressing these phenomena. We just need to be thinking very carefully about how to do it. And one of the challenges that, that we are having in, in the counterterrorism and countering violent extremism space is that this attention to issues of gender, uh, masculinity, and misogyny is very new. It is not well developed from a policy and practice perspective. And so we are a bit in a space where we are sort of pioneering and experimenting. And I think that it is really critically important to, to emphasize that we really need to be doing this with utmost care um, and thinking really carefully about how to monitor the actual impact of these policies, not just from an effectiveness perspective, or certainly also that, but predominantly also from a human rights perspective, and making sure that really the, the fundamental principle of, of do no harm uh, is, is fully respected um, in, in all of these uh, interventions. And so then in this sense, I kind of want to come back full circle to then the, the importance of, of this kind of research uh, to continue and to, to further grow because further analysis and, and academic inquiry into these issues is really indispensable so that we also in the, in the policy space can continue to adjust and, and improve and further develop our thinking as to how to address these issues. Uh, in concrete and practical ways. So um, I will end here and um, thanks very much and looking forward to the question. Thank you very much for these uh, great comments and for reflecting on
on the possibilities, but also the, the, the dangers of um, of using of, of different policy tools for addressing um, misogyny and um, violence. Um, um, Liz, would you like to um, respond briefly? Yeah, sure. Um, no, I think it, it, it it's incredibly important to point out, you know, the do no harm here, because it, it's absolutely fundamental. And it has not been the case that counter violent extremism and counter terrorism programs have have done no harm. But um, I think part of the issue is maybe that, you know, terrorism and violent extremism and extremism are, are still regarded um, and particularly, you know, in my field and by policy, they're regarded as something exceptional, you know, and, and they are just another form of crime in a way. And, you know, the, the work on masculinities, the terrorism studies has kind of ignored a lot of work that's been going on on gender in other spheres for a long time. But there's a lot of work, you know, a lot of the masculinities work comes actually from criminology. And, and there's a lot of masculinities scholars who've worked in criminology and they've worked on, you know, issues of um, domestic violence or just men's men's violence or child sexual abuse and exploitation and they've been working you know in terms of rehabilitation in therapeutic settings using some of the kind of insights from um from work on masculinities in those contexts and I think you know this it, it is absolutely important not to securitize um women's rights um the problem of misogyny which is hugely widespread and and you know frankly the authorities many of them don't have the the um the sort of legitimacy to do that because many of them are themselves you know implicated in in issues of you know um abuses of power and and misogyny so i think there is there is a way and i think the way is you know by looking at, at how work on masculinities in in other aspects of crime has been integrated into um, preventative measures community work and work in prisons and in in terms of um, probation and rehabilitation so i, I think for me that would be the way to the path to kind of go down. Unfortunately, I need to educate myself about exactly how that has happened because I, I don't know exactly how that happens.